We are so glad to have you with us this morning. If you're, if you're joining us online or if you're here in the house, man, it is great to be with you. I'm um, glad you're here with us. Um, we are praying that God's Spirit will be among us this morning. We're going to be talking more about that. Uh, there are a couple of announcements real quick I just want to run by you. Uh, the first one is um, there has been some question about uh, does Greenwood have a COVID response? Um, should somebody in the church come down with COVID that's been in a service at some point? What, what do we do? All of that is online. If you go to our website, greenwoodchurch.com, uh, there is a, a button on there that's COVID-19 response. And it will tell you what our protocol is for if something like that should happen and how you'll find out about it and what you need to do at that point and what we're going to do um, at that point as well. Also, this Saturday night at North Industry Christian Church, there is a barbecue chicken dinner. Um, they do this every year. It is a fundraiser for uh, the Mexico Children's Home. And so from, i got to look at my notes here. From 4.30 to 6.30, um, they're going to be offering this chicken dinner. Uh, tickets are, are uh, six fifty for just chicken, or if you want a full meal, uh, those are going to be twelve fifty. And you'll need to see Judy Rosnick before Thursday so they can get the orders in. Would you stand and join us as we go to God in prayer? <clears throat> God, we know that you are a great God, that you are over top of anything that happens in this world. And Father, we praise you. And we want you to know that we are your people and we want to be loyal to you. We want you to know that you and your, what you have done and what you're going to do is praise on our lips continuously. And so in this house this morning, right here, right now, we are here to say we praise you. Father, may you work among us, may you work in us, and may you work through us with the power of your word and with the power of your Holy Spirit to transform us into the likeness of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stay standing and, and continue to welcome that Holy Spirit into our hearts and into our midst. Holy Spirit, pray. i 
Let us experience more of your presence, Lord. What a prayer. What a powerful prayer. If you ever thought about those lyrics or about those kinds of words, and you begin to pray them and start asking God, let us experience more of your presence, I wonder what would happen when he starts allowing us to see and experience more of his presence. I wonder if we would recognize it. I wonder what it would look like. Throughout the scriptures, we have seen it happen in so many different ways of the way it took place. We know that in the Old Testament, after the temple was dedicated and, and uh, Solomon was just rejoicing over all the things that had happened, that the Bible says that the, the glory of the Lord filled the temple so much so that even the priests could not enter for three days to do their work. Wow. 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 I wonder what would happen if God's presence filled this place here right now. I wonder if we understood that God's presence, that God's Holy Spirit is a driving force inside of the church. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. This last weekend, I, I, along with millions of other people around the world, watched Hamilton. Anybody watch Hamilton last week? A few. Um, <laughs> I was blown away. I love Broadway musicals. I was brought up on Broadway musicals, and I just, I love that style of music. Um, matter of fact, some of the songs that I've written over the years, you'll recognize it in the way that I write. And so things like Scrub Scrub um, has that feel to it. Um, the thing is that blew me away was that this musical, actually it's more of an opera because there's no speaking lines, it's all music telling the story, is that there was a, a, a it's all in R&B and hip hop and, and different kinds of styles like that, that just you're sitting there going, this is Broadway? Um, it's far cry from Oklahoma and West Side Story that I grew up with. But it was wonderful. It was powerful. It was historical. A lot of uh, historical accuracy went into that. Um, the driving force behind that, though, was knowing that the character, who, the lead character who played Hamilton, is the one who wrote it all. He wrote all of the music. One song, one song in particular, took him over two years to forge those words out, to get those rhythms down, to get that music coming forth, and then to try and keep all that in his head and, and try and teach a cast of people, this is, what I, this is what it's going to sound like, it was powerful. And so in the, in the story of Hamilton was this driving force of understanding the, the lead character wrote the entire musical. Now, he had help with some other people on, on some of the songs, but he did the majority of the work. He was just a brilliant, brilliant actor, brilliant writer um, in the way that it was done. Um, if you don't enjoy that kind of music, I would not recommend seeing it. Um, I want you to understand, though, that, that there is an underlying force inside of the church that is just as much a driving force, just as much a powerful force as what, what we saw in Hamilton. The problem is, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we don't talk about him much. And a lot of it is because there's a lot of mystery surrounding the Holy Spirit. Well, what's he do? Who is he like? What, what, what is there involved with him? And to be honest with you, I don't know a lot about the Holy Spirit. I know some. I know what, some of what the Bible teaches. Um, but I do know that there are some things inside of the book of, of Acts that we're in that lead me to understand that the driving force behind the church is not the Apostle Paul. The driving force behind the church is actually the Holy Spirit. He is the one that needs to be responsible for it. He is the one who needs to be the frontline character. And in our story today, I hope that we begin to see more and more of how this is played out. And as we go through the, the chapters that uh, we've been going through, um, Tony has assigned me chapter 13 and 14. Just a little bit that we need to cover. So hang on to your hats. Here we go. <laughs> Actually, before we start, I want you to remember a passage of Scripture. 
Jesus had gathered his disciples around one night, and they, Jesus was asking them, who do people say that I am? What are the rumors out there? How are people responding? You know, what, what's being said about me? And they're saying, well, some say you're Elijah, some say you're a prophet. And, and so finally Jesus says, all right, let's cut through this all. Let's ask the question, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, well, thou art the Christ. Thou, you are the son of the living God. And, and Jesus said, Peter, upon this confession, upon these words, upon that thought, I will build my church and all of the powers of hell will not prevail against it, will not be able to stand up against it. I want us to keep that in mind as we continue our study about Paul's first missionary journey. Let's jump in real quick. Acts chapter 13 starts out, they're meeting in, in Antioch. This is the famous Antioch that we're aware of. It's the Syrian Antioch. Um, it's right up in the top end of the, the promised land area. Um, they're meeting there, and while they're there, the Bible says that there, there are some people there that, that the Bible calls out by name. The first one is Barnabas. We know something about Barnabas. We know that he is an encourager. There's a guy named Simeon called Niger. We don't know much about him, even in history. There's not much written about him. Uh, Lucius of Cyrene, we don't know anything about him either, except his name. Mannion, there's an interesting footnote put in here about this guy. It says, who had been brought up with Herod the Tatriarch. Now, this is the same Herod that beheaded John the Baptist. And I want you to see the irony here. This, this just blows me away. He, blew, he grew up with Herod that beheaded John the Baptist, which means that they were playmates growing up. In other words, Mannion had grew up in the, 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 the care, into the place of, of royalty. He was associated with it. And for some reason, somehow, and the Bible really doesn't tell us how, but he was able to, in that place of royalty to receive the message of Christ, became a Christian, and we find him here in, in the city of Antioch teaching about Christ. He was one of the primary teachers. I just find that amazing. Already, before the missionary journeys began, here is a guy that the Holy Spirit has, has already touched his heart with the message of Christ. His life has been changed, and now he's in a teaching position inside of the church. And then there was another guy named Saul that we know a lot about and we're studying more and more about. Um, and the Bible says that while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I called them. In Acts chapter 2, we find the disciples engaged in a very similar act of worship. In other words, they were learning the apostles' doctrine, they were sharing, they were breaking bread, they were praying. It was in the middle of this worship every day that God was moving and the Holy Spirit was adding to their number and every single day the church grew. It was the Holy Spirit that was involved in the middle of their mix, in the middle of their worship, in the middle of whatever it was they were doing. And here it is in Acts chapter 13, we find that some of the same things are going on. They're fasting, they're praying. We've got to understand that there are basic building blocks of the church. There are basic building blocks of the Christian faith. Things such as fasting and praying and, and learning and growing we also have to understand that it is into those that the Holy Spirit comes. And if the Holy Spirit is not in it, if the Holy Spirit is not in our worship, if he's not in the middle of our fasting and prayers, if he's not in the middle of whatever it is the church chooses to do, then the church is going to flop because we're only doing it by man-made power. And so here it is in Acts chapter 13, they're fasting and they're praying and the Holy Spirit shows up. And the Holy Spirit says, I want these two guys here. I want Paul and I want Barnabas. And I want, them to set, I want you to set them apart for the work in which I'm, I've called them to do. Understand that in the middle of our worship, in the middle of our spiritual lives, in the middle of our own spiritual training, we must train ourselves to listen to God and to recognize God's goodness. It is in these places that God gives his divine blessing. And so it was by no chance this morning that we sang those lyrics. 
let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Peter Lang, in his commentary, writes, when the church possesses spiritual life, missions prosper. When missions are actively maintained, the church prospers. And what gives missions their life and power, he asks? He says three things. The call of God in which it originated, the, fide the uh, fidelity of the, the laborers who are sent, and the prayers of the church by which it is all sustained. But then he asks the question, and how can the church secure the divine blessing when she engages in any work? And he says this, it is not by being directed by human calculations, but by yielding to the impulses of the Holy Spirit. It is not by premature rejoicings, but by a humble prayer. It is not by confiding in the names of men, but confiding in the name of the living God on whom all blessing depends. The Holy Spirit is in this. And when he's in it, we know that he's got it. We can trust him. We can have faith in that. And what we are going to find out is through the entire book of Acts that the Holy Spirit is this driving force that is able to help Paul and Barnabas on their journey in which the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against them. And so Paul and Barnabas start out. And so the first place they jump to is they jump to the island of Cyprus. Now, the island of Cyprus is reported to have about a million people on it at the time that Paul and Barnabas were there. It was an important place in, in Greek culture because it had major uh, seaports. Um, the seaport of Salamis, which is where Paul and Silas entered into to begin their journey across the, the island. Um, ships from all over the world would come and use the seaport. It was a major trade route. Um, Cyprus was a Roman, see if I can say this right, senatorial providence. In other words, there was a proconsul assigned to, the, to that providence, and that proconsul answered only to Augustus Caesar himself. So it was a pretty important place. When the, when the Roman official that oversaw the entire island answered directly to, to Caesar, that's eh, pretty, a pretty, pretty important place. From the eastern side of this island, they began, Paul and Barnabas began their journey walking through the island. They finally reached the other side to the, to the capital city of Paphos. Paphos was a place where people were given to self-indulgent flirtations. There was lewdness going on. There was lasciviousness. There was criminal activities, including lots of prostitution and drugs. The goddess Venus was, had a, an incredible temple there, and it's, this was the heart of where she was worshipped. She was, uh, uh, oversaw that, uh, the idea of, of love and sex and beauty and fertility. And in order to worship the goddess Vien, Venus, you actually went to the temple and you mated with one of the prostitutes. They called themselves um, more women who represented the goddess, um, and it was just their form of worship. And so there was a lot of sex going on inside of this city. Matter of fact, you could say it was a highly sexually charged city. Um, a lot of the entertainment that went on was very much sexually charged. And so that's the environment in which Paul and Silas and the gospel began, right into the heart of darkness, of sin that was going on. Paul and Barnabas began to speak, but there was a man named Bar-Jesus, also called Elymas, who begins to push back. Now, I don't know if Elymas realizes who's behind him, but he says to Paul and Silas, I was here before you, he screams at the Paul and Barnabas. In other words, he recognized that Paul and Barnabas was carrying some weight. There was something going on with them that he, that what they had to offer, they would get the ear of the proconsul. And Bar-Jesus was upset with that because he himself had that ear. He was afraid he was going to lose his political place. He was afraid he was going to lose his, his, the ear of, of the power, most powerful man. But Paul accuses him of being full of deceit and cunningness. He calls him a child of the devil, in other words, an enemy of righteousness. And Satan is revealed here as the father uh, and enemy of lies. Now, we know that from Jesus himself. In John chapter 8, Jesus was talking, and he said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
And so what Paul and Barnabas was saying about Elimaeus is something Jesus had already said. We know who Satan was. And now Satan is using Bar-Jesus and saying, you're wrong in trying to stop us. Matter of fact, because of Elimaeus' worry about his own popularity and his power um, and wanting to retain some sort of political influence, I wonder if you could say he was a lobbyist. Well, we won't go there. But do you remember the Holy Spirit? It was here he was working through Paul. Paul not only rebukes him, but Paul prophesies that Elimaeus would go blind for a time. Elimaeus goes blind, not as condemnation, but as punishment because it was only for a short season. He goes blind, and he became so disoriented that the Bible says he began to grope about. In other words, he could not see a thing. And he was begging people to help guide him where he needed to go. Back to the proconsul who oversaw and was watching all of this unfold. And the proconsul, the Bible says, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. He believed what Paul and Barnabas were telling him. He believed in the message because he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit began to, to clear the path for the message to be spoken, for Paul and Barnabas to be able to be heard, for, the, for it, the roots began to take place in the island of Cyprus, right in the capital of Paphos. From Paphos, they end up going across the sea, and they end up in a town called, called Perga. Perga uh, was, had a celebrated temple to the goddess Armidas, Ar, I'm sorry, Artemis, or better known as Diana, uh, depending upon whether you're referring to the Greek or the Roman culture, it's the same goddess. She was the patron and protector of young girls, um, she was believed to bring disease upon women and also relieve them of those diseases. She was also believed to be the primary goddess of childbirth and midwifery. <sighs> things didn't go a whole lot, a whole, things did not go well in the city of Perga. And as a result, Paul and Barnabas left the city. But never underestimate the seeds that were planted there. So they traveled from there to another city of Antioch. Not this, the Antioch they left from, but an Antioch that was pretty much straight north. Now, to get there from Perga, it was about 110 miles journey, but it was also up an elevation of about 3,600 feet. It was a very, very rough journey. But this Antioch was, was a very prominent place inside of the Roman Empire. It was a, a major trade route. It, it was deep into what we know as modern Turkey, today. And we also know that it was a very, very large city. For example, there were two, um, there have been two theaters or auditoriums that have been unearthed inside of archaeologist diggings. The first auditorium seats about 15,000 people. The second auditorium is in a horseshoe shape, think Ohio State Stadium, in a horseshoe shape that seated 30,000 people. Combined together, that seated about 45,000 people. That would fill up Progressive Field very nicely. And so there, we know that, that there was a lot of, of theater going on, a lot of Greek speaking, because when, when the people, the orators came to town or the philosophers came to town, it was in these places that they would begin to speak and people would come and listen to all the philosophy. We know that there are Roman baths. We know that there were monumental fountains. We know that there's a well-built aqueduct. We know that there's a men's sanctuary. It was deep into Hellenized territory. In other words, heavily, heavily Greek uh, uh, influenced in what was going on. It was a great trade area. Crossroads of major, it was a crossroad of, of major uh, intersections, uh, multiple intersections in that territory came through Antioch. But it was also a Roman colony. And this is what I find the most interesting. It was a Roman colony, so the majority of retired Roman soldiers ended up living there after they had retired. Wow. That's a lot of people. We also know that inside of Antioch, that there was a, a large population of Jews. There was a large population of people who would, we call them proselytes, people who had been converted to Judaism. And we know that there was a large Jewish synagogue there. 
And the synagogue provided a ready-made preaching place for Paul and Barnabas to go to. We know that there were regularly, regularly scheduled meetings. We know that the, the people there knew the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, when you were growing up in the Jewish culture, not only did you know the Old Testament, you had to memorize the entire Old Testament. And you've heard the rabbis teach about every single passage and nuance within, the, within those, those verses. And so what would happen was when the, the speaker would start to say a passage of Scripture, he wouldn't have to finish it. Because you already knew it, and you were already finishing it inside of your head. And they would begin to think of how that verse met and, and linked with this verse over here, and then with this verse over here, and then this verse over here. And so they kind of daisy-chain things together. We see this in the teachings of Jesus. Of Jesus. When Jesus is, begins to quote some Old Testament passages, a lot of times he does not quote the entire passage. He just begins the passage and because it's a famous passage in the Old Testament, the people already knew it. They were finishing it before his words could even come out. They were thinking about how it connected with all these other passages throughout the Old Testament. And so that's how they would recall Scripture. They would re daisy chain it together. And so it was into this environment that Paul and Barnabas came. Now, during the worship service in there, it was customary for visitors and especially visiting rabbis to speak to the gathering. And here's what happens in, verse, in chapter 13, verse 15. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue ruler sent for them, for Paul and Barnabas, saying, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. So Paul came up, and he silenced the crowds, and this is what he said. Fellow Israelites, and you Gentiles who worship God, the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, and he gave their, peop their property to his people as their inheritance. And all of this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, the son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, and he ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king, and God testified concerning him, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man who is after my own heart. He will do everything that I want him to do from this man's descendants. God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, just as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all people. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose that I am? I am not the one that you are looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I cannot even untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us then that this message of salvation has come. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, though they found no proper means for a death sentence. They asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, and they took him down from the tomb, down from the cross, and they laid him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee into Jerusalem, and they are witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. 
God raised him from the dead so that he would never be subject to, to decay. And as God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification that you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the entire city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. And then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. And since you reject it, and do not consider yourselves worthy of the eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. The Gentiles were, were elated. To hear this kind of good news was absolutely astounding in those days because at that point they only believed that God could only work through and in among the Israelites, the Jewish people. And now what Paul was saying was that, no, the word has come to the Gentiles. And so the Gentiles were really elated and they started following and listening to what Paul and Barnabas had to say. But can you imagine how it upset the Jews? And we, we find that, that not only they begin to contradict Paul and Barnabas, they began to heap abuse upon him. In other words, the, the, the rumors were starting. And then all of a sudden, it's, it, their, their, their jealousy begins to be displayed in a lot of different ways. They started getting people in the city to turn on Paul and Barnabas. The Bible says it this way, The word of the Lord spread throughout the entire region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing, and the elevated men of the city, they stirred up prosecution against Paul and Barnabas and had them expelled from the region. And so they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy, and say it with me, and with the Holy Spirit. Understand that Luke records in this book of Acts that there were seven different levels of people that, that the gospel had, pre, had reached the synagogue officials, the Jews who had belonged to the line of Jacob, the proselytes, those who had converted to Judaism, God-fearers, devout women of high standing, Gentiles, and leading men of the city. In other words, the gospel reached all levels of society. It wasn't just for poor people. It wasn't just for middle-class people. It wasn't just for Jewish people. Now the gospel is beginning to sh be shown that it is for all people. It didn't matter who you were or what your class was. The gospel was preached, seeds were planted, and the church began. And even with the trouble that they encountered in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas actually would return to Antioch, to the church at Antioch, on the return part of the journey in just a few months. From the opening pages of Genesis where the world is without form, and the Bible says that the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. 
And woven through every single book of the Bible all the way up through the book of Revelation, you'll find that the Holy Spirit stands with the bride, with the church, and is able to proclaim praises and glory to God with one voice. But where we see the Holy Spirit doing his greatest and most powerful work happens to be inside the New Testament. In the New Testament, uh, we, we know that John the Baptist was full of the Spirit even in his mother's womb. We know that Elizabeth, when she was greeted by Mary, was filled with the Holy Spirit. We know that Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was filled with the Spirit when he prophesied. We know that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and was led into the wilderness by the same Spirit. We know the disciples in the upper room, uh, when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, stood up to preach on the day of Pentecost. We know that Stephen was full of the Spirit when he saw God and when he was stoned. We know the Holy Spirit called Paul, Barnabas and Saul while they were fasting and praying. The Holy Spirit led Barnabas and Paul on their first missionary journey. And, the, and Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, rebuked a sorcerer. Are you getting the idea? That the Holy Spirit, from the opening pages to the ending pages of the Bible, has always been there is always here and will always be here and will always be working. The book of Acts is a book about the power of the church. And the power that is of the, of the church is the power that the Holy Spirit has breathed upon it. The Holy Spirit has empowered the disciples to start the church. He gave them boldness. He gave them comfort. He gave them joy. He gives them wisdom and discernment and power and strength to go on when they become weak. Convictions in their hearts of people who are willing to hear what God had to say. He, the Holy Spirit even brought back people from the dead. We know in uh, the story of Eutychus in chapter 20, Paul preaches until midnight. By the way, we're not going to be here till noon either. Um, but Paul preaches till midnight, and Eutychus falls out of a second-story uh, window and ends up dying. And Paul went out, and through the Holy Spirit, he was able to raise him from the dead. The heart of the movement of the church is the Holy Spirit. And if the church is not working and moving with the Holy Spirit and not allowing his presence to be there, not being directed by the Holy Spirit, then the church is, going to, is only working on man-made power and will never accomplish what God wants the church to do. Sadly, most churches are not. Most churches don't recognize, they don't talk about, they don't teach about, they don't move with the Holy Spirit. It's almost as if he doesn't exist. I want us to understand a few things about the Holy Spirit today. We, as believers, possess the Holy Spirit. He is indwelling within us. We know that, that, that the Holy Spirit comes with power. We begin to see that in Paul's missionary journey, how some doors were beginning to open, how some seeds were beginning to be planted, how the church began to have birth because of the Holy Spirit moving back some of the veils of darkness and being able to say, hey, here's a better way to live and the Holy Spirit gave that power. But Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 1 when he says, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the glorious riches of, of inheritance of his holy people, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and he seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. We have the same power. The same spirit that hovered over the face of the deep as the world was being formed, the same spirit that was with Jesus during his baptism, the same spirit that was infused into the, the apostles on the day of Pentecost, the same spirit that moved with, with the disciples as they went out and the church began, it is for anyone who believes. That same power. Second thing I want us to see about the Holy Spirit or understand about the Holy Spirit is he's the one who gives us words to speak. When we don't know what to say, when we don't know how to give a testimony, when we don't know how to be able to, to tell people about him, Jesus told his disciples it this way, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. 
On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what you will say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, it is the Holy Spirit. Third thing I want us to understand, it is the Holy Spirit that brings conviction into the hearts of people. Jesus said, when he comes, referring to the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, not ours. Our job is to simply point out an error. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict the person's heart. I want you to understand that these these men in the book of Acts are not the same men of the book of the Gospels. Oh, they, they carried the same bodies, they had the same looks, but they were different. They were different, and Max Lucado reminds us that they stood face to face with God, that Christ had taught them, that the Father had forgiven them, that the Holy Spirit now indwells within them. They cannot be the same. And what we see is they are not. We are not the same either. God has taught us. The Father has forgiven us. The Holy Spirit indwells within us. The same Holy Spirit that they had. We are not the same. And we need to stop living as though we were. We are children of God. We are children that are infused with the power of the Holy Spirit that we can be bold in the way we speak. Not stupid, but bold. The Holy Spirit is among us. Let us become more aware of his presence. Let us experience the goodness of God. Father, in this place right now, we know that you are here. Even if we can't sense it, even though we may not understand it, even though we don't see it all the time, we know that you are here, and by faith we believe you are working. You're working in us. You're working among us. You're working through us. Help us, Father, to become the children, to become the church that you want us to be, to accomplish what you want us to do. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please?
communion today in this day and age is maybe a little bit different than you've experienced in years past as we prepare for communion I ask you to to take the cup that you picked up on your way in for those of you that are not here in the sanctuary with us I hope that you've prepared to share in the Lord's Supper along with us sometimes things get a little bit difficult we can't handle them just the way that we've been familiar with. But we pick up and we continue to be faithful to what God has given us charge. And so we read these words in 1 Corinthians. I have received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you. And on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. You have it there before you. I'm going to ask you to take that bread. Hold it in your hand for just a moment. And remember what the Lord has done for you. He took the bread there at that supper. And he broke it and he passed it to his disciples. And we have it broken for us today. And we pass it among ourselves. The Lord offered up a time of prayer. It went something maybe a little like this. Lord, it's in their hands. Heavenly Father, it's just bread, so they think. Help them to realize that this is my body, which is being delivered up for them. Bless them now, Lord. And then he took the bread, he blessed it, and they participated together. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. You have your cup. He passed it among them. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the saints be with you all. Have a great week.